Well, good morning, church. Would you stand with me? This is from Romans 11. It says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has, been a gift, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Lord, we come to you this morning uh, with thanksgiving for your grace in our lives, for your mercy that's new this morning now. And as we gather as your church, Lord, we lift our voices in unison together to declare that you are king, that you are ruler over all the earth, Lord of the seas and of the skies and the ground underneath our feet, that you give us breath in our lungs to live and to worship you, Lord. So hear our worship this morning, we pray in Jesus' name.
Gracious Father, we just uh, we just are so thankful and blessed uh, your goodness and your faithfulness uh, goes beyond anything that we uh, in this world can possibly understand. Lord, as we come together for worship this morning, as we come together for the word, uh, we just ask that your presence uh, fills, uh, fills the empty parts of our heart this morning, Lord. Let that be 
uh, the spirit of, of listening, the spirit of hearing, the spirit of your word just uh, overwhelming each one of us. We just ask all of this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. So turn to somebody who you don't know and say good morning. Hey everybody, good morning. Uh, my name's Steve, I'm one of the pastors here. And the first thing I wanna do today is I just wanna, can we celebrate Backpack to School? Get this, we're gonna have a picture we're gonna throw up here. A bunch of people came to the church Wednesday and packed 1,700 backpacks. This is one of the snapshots. Amen, amen. We're giving thanks to God in that clap. Uh, we're giving thanks to people who served. Janice Ansa and Cindy Corson, of course, put it together year after year, but a lot of people served to make that happen. And those backpacks are going to wind up in Bucks County, South Philly, and Gloucester City, uh, just south of Camden. And kids and families are going to be served. So another way we serve, so we're celebrating that service, and we're going to serve now through our offering. So I'm going to have the ushers come forward and take the offering. There's different ways to give. This isn't a halftime from worship. We're continuing worship as we give this offering. And we do, this isn't just a talking point, but it's really true. We give to stuff going on around the world and around the region. And we're seeking to grow that. And this is a Christian calling. It's a discipline, uh, it's a joy to participate in the grace of giving. So I pray that you participate in that. If you haven't gotten into that discipleship rhythm yet, I wanna call you to that in Jesus, if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, uh, feel no compulsion to take part in um, what we're doing right now. If you are a Christian, you should do this. Uh, and not just our money, but we actually serve with our presence, right? One of our discipleship rhythms is generosity. And it's not just generosity with funds, but actually our presence, our time, our gifts, as each has received a gift, First Peter says, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. How has Jesus graced you to serve and bless brothers and sisters in Jesus and also people in your community. And I'm just gonna go through a couple announcements right now that are opportunities to serve here within the church. There's many ways to serve in the community. Here are some coming up in the church. We also have a slide for this, okay? There's a training next week, okay? August 20th at 1215, right after the service, and it's for community group, basically Bible study leaders, community group leaders, CS, covenant students, youth group leaders, children's leaders. If you've ever thought about helping out with this stuff, and uh, it's a privilege to serve each other in love, it's precious to God, and uh, we'll help you. Man, we'll set you up to win. All that training is happening next week August 20th. Today is the last day to register for child care. If you're like, hey, I want to hang out, but my kids just go ballistic and want to hike, you know, make a beeline for the car, we're actually going to have some stuff for child care next week, but you need to sign up for that today. Um, all these signups are online, and the community group, uh, the community group leaders, we're going to seek to start, have 40 community groups go through the book of Colossians this fall. Okay, September 10th through the month of October. Do a deep dive through the book of Colossians. Make this part of our lives. And we're going to train the leaders. Okay, so you can sign up for that. Uh, be trained in that. That sign up is online. Let's get ready for the year. Second opportunity to serve get this next week the week after the week after next week it's two weeks from today august 27th 
training for cafe, greeters, ushers. Uh, maybe you're like exploring Jesus and you're like, hey, I'm trying to figure out what I think about all this, but I'd help out in the cafe. It's a way to serve each other in love. Uh, greeters, ushers, that's coming August 27th. There's also one sign up online, which I'll quickly mention, uh, the theater group night, August 22nd at 7 p.m. That's also open to all. And all uh, the way to sign up is on the website. So I'm going to pray for all that right now. And I want to say to high school grads, uh, we're going to pray for you at the end of the service. High school graduates who are entering the workplace or maybe going to some kind of training institution or uh, college. We're going to pray for all of you at the end of the service. So I just want to give you a heads up on that because I'm going to ask you to stand. But now, would you join me in prayer? So we just pray for all that we talked about. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for this offering. And we give it to you as an act of service and sacrifice. Because, Lord Jesus, your sacrifice for us. And your love for us. And your grace to us. So we thank you. And we also, uh, all the gifts online and the ones that happen now, we offer up not just our money, but our lives and our hearts in response to your goodness. Uh, we pray that uh, we would be in this discipleship rhythm in a way that loves you and honors you. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to grow us as a church that serves each other in love through leading community groups with children, students, all the cafe, all the ways we serve within the church actually too many to mention right now and also again we pray that we would be a blessing to our community the many ways that we seek to live out the love of god and share the words of jesus in our community grow us in these things we pray and receive our praise and gratitude we ask in jesus name amen amen, amen. all right i am going to have a lot of fun doing this i'm going to get a I'm going to get to introduce one of my best friends in the world. He's going to come preach for us. Um, a loving friend is going to preach about being a loving church. And I just want to tell you about my friend Kevin here. Uh, me and another group of pastors, we realized in the stress of ministry, look, I'm pursuing brotherhood and a friendship within this church. I really am experiencing that by God's grace from so many elders. I'm really grateful for that. And also, it's good for pastors to have connections with other pastors. And so a bunch of lonely pastors said, hey, let's meet together, pray for each other, pour into each other. There's five of us uh, that have done that. Kevin is one of those brothers. I don't have a, uh, I don't have a physical brother, but I have Kevin and other brothers. And uh, brothers like to tease each other. One, uh, one time we were uh, mountain biking in Arizona. And I'm well prepared to mountain bike in Arizona because I've trained in the Pennsylvania deserts. <laughs> and so I knew what I was doing. And so I quickly drank as much water as I could to last in the desert. And so when I was ready to throw up, Kevin did what a good friend and brother does to take out his iPhone at that moment <laughs> and record that. Uh, and that's what kind of, we love to tease each other. And uh, in God's providence and grace, there was a, we had this one retreat together where he had actually been hurt um, in a bike accident and we need to carry his stuff around. We, he had, had to sit in a specific chair we had to help him and like cor corporations hire people to do like trust exercises this was like a a trust exercise with kevin my friend and in the course of that retreat i became aware and actually convicted there's things in my life that i actually hadn't given my brothers the opportunity to carry for me and with me and some of that stuff was stuff going on uh, in our family with one of my kids in particular and I, I opened up about that, and uh, the response to that was really profound. 
and the way God used that and other things to actually teach us to carry things for each other, which we have. Uh, I had admired, I was admiring Kevin's bag because he spends way too much online researching things like bags, but he does know about bags. Uh, I was admiring his bag, and after that, he p- prayed profoundly for me there. I have this note from him that I'm never going to get rid of. I get this package in the mail after that retreat, and it's the bag I've been admiring, admiring, and his note to me, this is what I've kept forever, said, Steve, you're carrying a lot. I hope that this bag reminds you you don't carry it alone. I love you, your friend Kevin. Uh, So that's what kind of a friend he is. Isn't that what kind of friend we're called to be with and for each other? So, Covenant, would you please welcome this friend that I love so much and a new friend of Covenant Church, Mr. Kevin Cawley. I love you, dude. Love you, man. Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, it's interesting that Steve mentioned that photograph that I took of him because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break precedent from what I think you guys do here normally. And I'm actually just going to spend time. I have about 100 photos of Steve <laughs> that I've taken over the years. Most of them are PG. A few of them you might want to cover your kids' eyes. And I'm just going to provide commentary on. We're going to step outside your normal series. And I'm just going to, you know, do a photo book with Pastor Steve. Um, so let's pray and we'll get ready for that time. I'm teasing. Um, I really do want to talk with you about love today. It's funny because over the past week, I've mentioned to a handful of people, they said, oh man, you're, you're going to Pennsylvania. Um, what are you talking about? And I said, I'm sharing with this church about love. No kidding. In each instance that I've shared that, including Christine Huber yesterday, these people laugh in my face. I'm like, I'm going to talk about love. They're like, yeah, but, but for real, what are you going to talk about? I, th- I think they did that because they know that I'm sarcastic and try to be cheeky. And that's kind of a cheeky answer to give. Like I'm going to a church, I'm going to talk about love. But maybe, maybe they've said it because like, when you think about me, there's a lot of things that come to your mind immediately that I'm large or that I'm loud, but uh, that I'm competent to teach about love is probably not one of the first ones. But, but I want to come here and share with you about love specifically the love of God, which Paul outlines for us in 1 Corinthians 13. He's not talking about love in the abstract. He's talking about the character of God. And I want to talk about that love, and I want to exhort you, together with myself, that we would be a loving people. And I think you can agree with me that society is experiencing this, seems like continual, tragic, continual regression. Relationships are fragmented everywhere. They're fragmented inside our families. They're fragmented in what used to be thicker communities around us. And we need to be honest about this. They're fragmented inside the church. So what what I want to do by God's grace is just hold forth what love is with you and then exhort you um, to put away all that is loveless among you. So pray with me and we'll get into this text together. God, your word tells us that we wouldn't know what love was if you hadn't shown it to us. So would you humble us? Would you open our hearts and our eyes and our minds to receive your word and to respond to it by faith? For people that have walked with you for years, I ask that they would receive this word and... um, By your grace, you would change them. And for people in this room that are exploring what it might be like to know you and love you and trust you and follow you, would you use this word about who you are and who you form us to be to change them? Would people say 30 years from now, I met Jesus. I met Jesus on a day where we talked about a sermon that I just thought was reserved for weddings. So God, do all the things that... um, you've purposed to do in this time, including inside of me, not just with my voice, but use my voice and my words to glorify you. I ask in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. First Corinthians chapter 13. 
turn there if you've got a Bible. And I want you to think about this as you turn there. It is possible to be zealous about the Word of God and to miss the way of God and tear down the work of God. I'm going to say that again for you. It's possible to be zealous, diligent, committed to, like fervent in the Word of God and miss the way of God and tear down the work of God. It's possible to be passionate about laboring in the works of God, yet miss the way of God and obstruct the very work of God that you're zealous for. This is the logic of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Read it with me. Paul says this, If I speak in tongues of men and angels, But have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I am gain nothing. What Paul's laying out for us in these first three verses of this love chapter is the logic of lovelessness. This is the logic of lovelessness. And think about this. Paul is saying, I can be zealous. I can be zealous for the Word of God and yet not adapt or be conformed to or be animated by the way of God, that can be a distraction to the work of God. That's what a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal is. He says, hey, I I can be zealous for the works of God. I can give away everything I have. I can give away everything I have, but not be attuned to the way of God. And I can gain nothing. This is the logic of lovelessness. And I want us, by God's grace, to walk in the way of love. Now, why do I keep using this word way, the way of love? Because that's actually the context for our passage this morning. Like, I joke, but we often think about, or, or almost exclusively think about 1 Corinthians 13 as a wedding text. Like, how often do you hear 1 Corinthians 13 preached outside of a wedding? And no shade on you if you had this read at your wedding. I had it read at my wedding. But Paul didn't write this so that we could have a text to be preached at our weddings. He wrote this to help a church navigate conflict they were experiencing in terms of how they practice the gifts of God together in their church life together. And he says at the end of chapter 12, if you've got your Bible, he says, hey, I want to show you, this is verse 31 of chapter 12, a still a more excellent way. Paul says, I, I want to talk to you about a way. And this isn't just the way you navigate conflict regarding the practice of spiritual gifts in the church. This is the way you navigate every conflict that Paul has unpacked them in the first 11 chapters of 1 Corinthians. And it's the way you do everything. Paul says, I want to put forth in, in, in your pathway, I want to exhort you with a way. So what I want to do in the time we have this morning is I want us to look at verses 4 to 7, specifically of 1 Corinthians 13, and I want us to talk about this way of love. And I want us to do three things together. I want us to talk about what love is. I want us to talk about what love does. And then I want to exhort you specifically to talk about how you as a church and you personally can remove what hinders love. I want to talk about what love is, what love does, and how we can, by God's grace, remove what hinders love. Let's read verses 4 to 7 together, 1 Corinthians 13, and then we'll just talk about those three things. Paul has given us the logic of lovelessness, and now he tells us the way of love. 
Verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And he says, concluding that narration, love never ends. What is love? And let's just walk through quickly this catalog that Paul gives us. I just want to offer you brief commentary so we can get a portrait of what love is. Because it's not a feeling. It's not just a poetic device. And it's not something detached from reality that we just ponder <laughs> as if it's out there. Paul like, lays before us the nature of love. And he says that love is patient. Meaning love is long-suffering. And patience isn't passive. Patience requires an unbelievable steadfastness and aggression of the soul. Because patience requires me to trust that God will accomplish his purposes fully and finally and ultimately. And therefore, I do not have to demand that my purposes be accomplished now. When he says love is patient, he doesn't just mean, hey, chill. Because he could have said that. But he's actually exhorting us to see something about the purposes and the will of God and how God does his work so that we can stand fast when we see things faltering or failing around us. And by the way, patience is not the acceptance of evil. We can renounce and reject and speak out against and stand against evil even as we're called to patiently endure it. Love is kind, Paul says. Lewis Smedes, in his book, Love Within Limits, which is a book about 1 Corinthians 13, says this. Kindness is love's readiness to enhance the life of another person, but it's more. It's the power to move close to another person in order to heal them. It's in order to heal them. Which I want to belabor this point because we hear love is kind and I think we inadvertently think love is nice. But kind and nice are not the same thing. In fact, niceness so often abandons love in favor of self-preservation, self-protection, self-comfort. You just look at people and like engage them in a particular way. It's like, well, I don't want to exert any more of myself than I need to. And people go... Ted, he's so nice. But maybe, maybe what God's calling you to be is kind. And kindness isn't always nice. It's the kindness of a surgeon that moves him to cut out a tumor with a scalpel. It's the kindness of a parent that leads them to discipline a child. And are any of us, are any of us under the illusion or delusion that discipline is nice? Are there any kids in the room that want to testify? <laughs> discipline is not nice. Discipline is kind. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. Envy is the pain we feel when we look at somebody else and they have something we want. And we punish them with this pain. This is how envy works because we think, I deserve that. Whether it's a physical thing, a material thing, whether it's the praise or commendation of another. And Paul says, love doesn't envy. Love doesn't boast. Boasting is our marketing department. It's our own personal marketing department. And sometimes we embellish in our marketing department, and sometimes we tell the truth. But the problem with boasting is, boasting isn't satisfied with the goodness another person is experiencing. It wants to put the spotlight on us away from them. Paul says, love delights in the good of another, and it isn't motivated to distort reality and pull attention to me. Some people that boast are liars. Some people that boast are honest. Like what, what they need to do is learn how to delight in you and your accomplishments and the good of another instead of announcing 
their own good and how it compares or not. Love is not arrogant or rude, Paul says. And this has everything to do with how we grievously rank human beings around us in some kind of pecking order of what they have to offer us. Can we just acknowledge, like, we do that all the time, and it's insidious. And what arrogance or rudeness does is it treats people down the chain in such a way as to remind them that they're down the chain, that we're higher than them now. But listen to me, friends. Love doesn't rank people in order of what they can give me. Love delights in human beings in accordance with their bearing the mark of the image of God. Love doesn't insist on its own way. Oh, how, how could we, by God's grace, trust in God's goodness, God's provision, God's mercy, God's power, to the degree that we don't demand that everyone conform to our own way? Can I tell you what's hard about this? Wives are elbowing husbands. I just seen it earlier. That's not what's hard about that. What's hard about that is my own way is always right. Can I get an amen? Your way is right. What are all these other idiots doing? Like, why can't they just see things through my eyes? Paul says, love actually orients the world not through my eyes, but through God's eyes, such that I don't have to demand that you see things my way or conform to my way. And man, is that hard. Man, is that hard. But how much conflict is rooted in when I place a moral value on you not sharing my opinion? God, help us. God, make us loving. Love doesn't do that. Love isn't irritable, Paul says. Which irritation is rooted in my desire to have everything I want now. Sometimes that's silence in the car. God bless my children. Sometimes it's something else. Sometimes it's your affirmation. Sometimes it's like customer service to be faster. Irritableness says, hey, everyone should actually orient their lives around me. Paul says love, love doesn't do that. I don't know what your household is like. I'm sure your kids are holier than mine and more special than mine and everything else. But what we deal with in the Collie House all the time is this phrase. Oh, that was so annoying. That was so annoying. And I'm always trying to help my kids understand, which, by the way, they learned that from me. They learned that from me. I say to my wife all the time, where on earth did they learn that? She's like, have you ever listened to yourself talk? They learned it from you. This is so annoying. I'm like, hey, guys. And this is when I like put pastor dad hat on and they sigh. I'm like, hey, when, when you're annoyed by something, it's because you're working from the assumptions that everybody should see things your way, do things your way, and you should have every desire you possess met now. That's not, that's not what love is. Love trusts God to accomplish his agenda in such a way that it relativizes my attitude about my agenda. Love trusts God to accomplish his agenda in such a way that it relativizes my attitude about my agenda. Love can forego my satisfaction for the sake of the satisfaction of another. Love isn't resentful. And resentment is just the fruit that grows from past irritation. Resentment means that I'm treating you today for some offense, whether it was real or imagined, that you did a time ago. Resentment starts to tell me a story, or resentment is the story that we form about why that person is not worthy of my friendship or my generosity or my love. Paul says, love doesn't do that. Love is satisfied and contented in what God is, and therefore it doesn't make demands on others or make them pay for the way they failed to meet us in past demands. Love does not rejoice with wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Now, if you know anything about the church at Corinth, this was the heart of lovelessness in their church. This was the heart of lovelessness in their church. They were seeing all manners of sin and calling it righteous. They were seeing disobedience to God and calling it honorable. And, and isn't that at least within the, you know, scatter pattern 
of our current perils as a society and as a church in this moment. Paul, Paul says this isn't an issue about being left or right or progressive or conservative. This is a fundamental issue about what is loving and what is loveless. Love does not rejoice with wrongdoing, but it rejoices to the truth. And then Paul shifts in verse 7 to make one of the most densely compacted, potent, life-changing, glorious sentences in the Bible. I feel like that about a lot of them, but this one has changed my life and has illuminated my past and has given me a longing and a fervor for God to move in my life and yours now. Look at verse 7 with me. Paul says, love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, and it endures all things. If verses 1 to 3 of 1 Corinthians 13 provide for us the logic of lovelessness, verse 7 extends to us the logic of love. Let's just talk by way of observation about what love does. Paul says love bears all things. And he doesn't mean that it nervously, you know, overreacts and overfunctions to carry other people's issues. This is bearing in the sense of bearing up under something. Paul is saying love endures, love produces restraint, love calms our tendency to say too much or to let someone know how they're failing us in the moment. Love bears all things. Love enables us to overlook offenses. Proverbs 19, 11. It's a glorious thing to overlook an offense, God's word says. Love covers a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4, 8. But not all of them. And what I mean is, it is a loving thing to bear offenses, to cover over offenses. But some offenses, love requires that they be exposed. The abuse of another person or something like that. So there's a sense in which to bear under love sometimes requires that we cover things over and sometimes requires that we expose them. And wisdom is required to know which is which. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Now think about this for a minute. There, there's like a spectrum of belief. Right? I'm sure there's a more nuanced way you could describe it than this. But let's imagine in the spectrum of belief, you have gullibility on one end of the spectrum and cynicism on the other. Gullibility believes everything and cynicism believes nothing. Now, with that spectrum agreed upon just for the sake of conversation, look at the Bible and understand that Paul places love on the side of what we would call gullibility. Paul says, hey, love is going to open itself up and trust God to do what God does and believe that God will accomplish all his true, beautiful, and good purposes in the end so that I don't have to be closed. You see, cynicism suspects all things, refuses to believe all things. And hey, I, I, I got cut even this morning just praying for you guys because I am cynical. I've prided myself on being cynical. Ain't nobody gonna, nobody gonna slip one over on me. I'm gonna see through it all. But what I realized this morning is cynicism is antithetical to love. You cannot be, check this out, you cannot be cynical and loving. God help us. You cannot be cynical and loving because love is the opposite cynicism. Love believes all things. We use this kind of phrase, I suspect you're familiar with it, that we've taken from this passage, love believes the best about people. And what that means is I'm not going to labor in a moment of a lack of clarity or a moment when I experience something that seems off kilter, I'm not going to assign evil motives to you. Which, what is it about us that we constantly assign evil motives to people? And in our world, every single experience we have in, an, in a subconscious, immediate way, we chop everything up and file every event under people's motives, which we all, almost always assign nefarious motives to others, and our motives are pure as the driven snow. 
What is it about us that does that? And here's what's crazy. The Bible clearly says, and our experience clearly bears out, that there's times that I don't even understand my own motives. Why did you do that? Like, uh, it's complicated and I don't know. So what is it about us that if we can't even understand our own motives, we presume to understand everyone else's motives? That's opposed to love. Love tells a better story about somebody in the absence of data. See, when you have a gap between what you believe about someone and what you experience with them, you have a choice to fill that gap with judgment or to fill that gap with love. And Paul says love believes all things. I had a guy say to me several years ago, yeah, I believe the best about people until I experience the worst about them. And this guy was a pastor. I said, hey, brother, all due respect, that's absurd. It's absurd and it's insane and it's patently opposed to the words of Scripture. You don't need to believe the best about someone when you're experiencing the best about them. It's just like, hey, times are good. You only need to experience the best, to believe the best about them when you experience the worst about them. And, and plus, the Bible commands us to do that. Believing the best means I will not insert evil motives about this person not knowing them. And it means I believe God is telling a bigger story in this moment than I can see. Here are the things that God is doing in your life, in the life of those you're in relationship with in the world that you're not aware of. So perhaps God has motives here that you're not clear on. Man, I wish I had more time. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Even when the facts seem to show otherwise, love hopes. Even when you actually learn relationally that the motives of somebody else were nefarious or were selfish or were deluded or were oriented toward your destruction, that's the place love hopes otherwise. God, even though I've experienced this and even though the information has told me that the sense I was inclined to make about my experience is true, I will stand here in defiant, patient hope that this will not be the end of the story. See, hope isn't a thin wish. Like, I, <laughs> I desire my flights home to Oklahoma today to be smooth and without obstruction in the great city of Atlanta. That is a desire I have. But that's, that's not hope, biblically speaking. Hope is a steadfast certainty we have of things that we know will be accomplished in the future even though everything else in our experience now bears it out where it seems like that would be impossible. This is a, I know that God will accomplish his purposes even if it seems like this is way outside his farm now. Love, hopes, hope is the active desire it's the active desire for something we know we will possess or experience later. And Paul says, hope is a loving posture in the midst of adversity, calamity, relational brokenness, destruction. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Now, let me say this really clearly. Love does not remove horrific things from our lives. Like, for you to submit yourself to the God who is love does not guarantee that all the horrific things will be ruined from your life. If you're sitting there doubting me, just wait. Just wait. And, like, what is it about our God that, like, puts his thumb on the ones he loves the most? If we see this bear out through all of Scripture, he has great and glorious purposes for us. But it does not mean that horrific things will be terminated now. In fact, God uses horrific things to form in us the image of Jesus. It's like when, when Paul says that love endures all things, he doesn't mean that he's going to eradicate horrificness from your life, nor does it mean he's going to eradicate you or make you immune from the lovelessness of others. It means in the midst of the lovelessness of others or the effects of our own lovelessness, 
we can bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Love endures lovelessness. Love endures lovelessness. Love endures lovelessness. Love endures evil. And I think about like the evils of living in a fallen world. Tornadoes where I live in Oklahoma. Or tumors where all of us live. Just the natural effects of the fall. Some evil has personal moral agents. Like that person did that thing that has these consequences. Sometimes that person is you. Sometimes that person is me. Love endures the lovelessness of others. Love endures the blows of lovelessness, the slander of lovelessness, the heartache of lovelessness. Love endures. Now, I don't know what you guys talk about here on a regular basis, but one of the things I'm, I'm often talking about and often yearning for is to see resilience reinstated and recultivated in the fabric of our society. We just lack resilience everywhere. And the more I contemplate the absence of resilience, I'm beginning to wonder and maybe even believe that the absence of resilience in our world is actually just the manifest presence of lovelessness in our world. Because all the places we're wanting people to be resilient, to want people to endure and get strong in the face of opposition, in the face of failure, in the face of brokenness, in the face of evil, is love. Like, how can we be a loving people in the midst of a broken world? And Paul says in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 13, love never ends. And he says to the Corinthians in chapter 7, verse 31, that the present form of this world is passing away. That should tell you two things. It means that there will come a day when lovelessness will cease and we will gather around the throne of the one who is love and we will worship him for his love forever. Forever. And it means that God is actively now through his bride, the church, in light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God is now removing lovelessness from the world. God is removing lovelessness from the world, and he will do this continually until he removes it fully and finally in the day of Christ Jesus. I want you just to think for a second about all that is loveless. And don't make this about someone else's problem. Think about all that's loveless within you. Think about all that's anxious, nervous, agitated, fierce, brutal, judgmental, resentful, rigid, inflexible. And think about the ways in which God is removing all that hinders love in you. Think about all that's bad-tempered. Think about all that's testy or touchy or prickly, or annoyed. Think about all that's resentful. Think about all the ways in which you keep score. And think about the ways in which the God of heaven, the God of love, is committed to removing that lovelessness from you. He's committed to remove that lovelessness from you. I used to go to this prayer meeting that a friend of mine led worship in. And every time we had this prayer meeting, my friend would sing this song, the verses of which I can't remember, but the chorus had this line in it that we sang over and over and over again. Maybe too many times repeat it for Presbyterians, but it was, it was helpful. And the line was, bridegroom, king, and judge, remove what hinders love. And as I experienced the effects of lovelessness in my own life, not just the lovelessness of others, but the effects of my own lovelessness. And we sang that song. I realized that not only was this a petition, but it was a declaration of what God is eternally committed to do. He is committed to remove all that hinders love from us now. And he will remove all lovelessness from us forever. There is a day coming, my brothers and sisters, and it is a real day when the one who is love 
will remove all that is loveless from you and me. So in closing, I just want to ask you three questions. And these aren't rhetorical questions. These aren't church questions. These aren't like the preacher thing that signals that I'm landing the plane. I actually would appreciate you like, copying them down wrestling with them with your friends. You're not going to answer them now. It's like, oh, that was easy. Done. These are things that require prayerful meditation. Here they are. Question number one, where do you need to encounter the love of God? Because you can't actually embody the love of God apart from being freed by it, washed in it, cleansed by it fed by it, animated by it. Where do you need to encounter the love of God? You. Not your wife. Not your husband. Not your boyfriend. Not your girlfriend. Not your adult child who's struggling. Where do you need to encounter the love of God? Question number two. Where do you need to be freed from the destructive consequences of lovelessness? Where do you need to be freed from the destructive consequences of lovelessness? And for some of you, that's your own lovelessness. Like where where are there consequences of your lovelessness that you need to ask for someone's forgiveness? You need to seek healing. Or maybe you just need to trust God that he's forgiven you and walk away. Or maybe it's the lovelessness of someone else. Like, where do you need to ask for forgiveness? Or where do you need to offer it? Whether they've asked for it or not. Think about the unrepentant lovelessness of others in your life. And where can you be free today by saying, I will not hold this against them. I will trust Jesus, the judge of all things, to judge rightly. Where do you need to be freed from the destructive consequences of lovelessness? And then my last question for you is, what's one element of lovelessness in your life? One element of lovelessness in your life that by God's grace, you could like, Remove now, today. You could say, oh, I, I've always just excused that. as like, well, I'm wired that way. But it's actually lovelessness. This was a, a, a ball-peen hammer to the side of my head when I realized, like, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm big, I'm loud, I'm brash, I'm impatient. And a woman who loves me enough to look me in the face and tell me the truth, she said, hey, you can call that whatever you want. The Bible calls it lovelessness, and God hates it. Jesus died to free you from its consequences and from its presence in your life. Call call it, well, you know, we're the callies. We're just loud. No, no, no. Hey, maybe it's lovelessness. What's one thing that as you look at this passage and you meditate on the truth of who God is and what God desires to be embodied among his people, what's one aspect of lovelessness that you could, in Paul's parlance, Put to death by the Spirit. Ask someone to hold you accountable. Ask people that love you to speak the truth to you. Like, hey, can we have a hand signal like when I'm doing that thing that I've just always called, oh, it's eccentricity, but it's actually loveless. Oh, that's that's actually, I'm, I'm actually boasting. Would you help me? Would you wave a sign or do something discreet so I'll know, pull your ear? What's, what's one thing? And hey, here's, here's, I'll just say it again, like, I have seen people who are zealous for the word of God, but ignorant of the way of God, tear down the effect of the word. I've seen people zealous for the work of God, not in line with the way of God, impede it. And I've done that. I have been zealous for God's word and been unshaped or failed to be animated by his way. And I've torn down his work. The good news of the gospel of Jesus is God, the one who is love, entered into our world. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless, 
loving life. There was no lovelessness in him. And the one who was loved perfectly endured the cross, despising its shame, and set himself down at the right hand of the throne of God so that you and I, loveless people, could be called loving by the one who is love. Pray with me. Jesus, you are the bridegroom, king, and judge. And thank you that you received in your body the wrath of God for all that hinders love. Would you awaken a new day among my brothers and sisters in this church and give them a newfound biblical clarity to call what is loveless, loveless, and to buy your grace and with fascination at the person and the sacrifice and the love of Jesus, walk in what is loving. God, we need so much help. Thank you that you came to free us from the wrath of sin and its shame. So let us walk in the freedom and the power of the resurrection of Jesus, the King of love. I pray in his name, amen.
so greatly loved us, who's put the breath in our lungs, who sent a great Savior for us to save us from our love, our lovelessness and redeem us. And we're going to pray, and I'm going to send you out. I'm going to ask you to be seated, except if you're a graduate. You can be seated, everybody, except if you're a high school graduate. And we're going to pray for you high school graduates. Look, we got some here. Thank you for remaining standing. Uh, we had a bunch in the first service. We have some here. We're going to pray for you as you enter the workforce or enter some kind of training institute for your work or a college or university. Let's, as your loving community, uh, let's pray for these folks as their loving community. Amen? Let's pray for the seniors. Lord, we thank you for these seniors who have graduated and who now are in, this is a, a season of transition. Some of them are entering the workforce. Some are going to some kind of trade school. Some are going to a college or university. We pray that you would keep these brothers and sisters in Jesus at this time of their lives, keep them connected to Jesus. We pray uh, for these graduated seniors to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. We pray they would connect with Jesus' people. We pray they would be in community and study the Bible and worship Jesus on Sunday with his people in a church someplace. We pray you would connect them in a deep way to the mission of Jesus in the world. And we pray that they would grow in knowing their gifts to be a blessing to others in this world. Lord, bless them. We love them. We thank you for them. I invite you to stand up right now, and I'm going to send you out with this charge and blessing. At the end of every service, we have ascending. I invite you to open your hands. Covenant, brothers and sisters, I exhort you to go serve your neighbors, friends, co-workers, and love this week. You'll do have the opportunity, opportunity to do deeds of service no one will ever see, but your Father in heaven sees them and they're precious to him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and is gracious towards you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Praise God.